Hello and welcome to the latest Renegade Investor Report with me, Graham Rowan. And uh, this week, we're looking at the whole topic of value investing and whether after a not so great decade in the 2010s, whether the 2020s could be the period for value investing to finally come into its own. Uh, the Renegade Report is brought to you by uh, Beaufort Society, the private uh, members club for high net worth investors. And you can learn all about them and their portfolio of uh, alternative investments at BeauftSociety.com. And also uh, by Crypto for Grownups, which is trying to educate the over 40s in this wonderful new world of digital assets to see whether they think they should be involved or not. And you can find out about that at CryptoForGrownups.co.uk. So we want to talk about value investing. And to do that, I'm really delighted to, to welcome to Renegade Investor Report uh, an old friend and, and a, a man I regard as a, a voice of reason in these weird and wacky times. And that is Tim Price. Tim, welcome to the program. Thanks, Graham. No, uh, just to say you. a little bit bit about Tim. He's, he's the founder of Price Value Partners, which is a, uh, a, a, an a asset manager that, that really obviously is focused on this whole value sector. And you can learn more about them and, and the, the uh, things they offer at pricevaluepartners.com. Um, and he's been around the block a few times. He's had more than 25 years in the capital markets, uh, 15 years as a discretionary multi-asset portfolio manager and chief investment officer, places like Henry Ansbacher, Union Bancaire Privé and PFP Group, which is where I first met him. He's shortlisted for five years in a row for the UK Private Asset Managers Programme and won it in 2005 for defensive investing. And of course, many of you will know him for his articles in Money Week magazine. So, so I'm delighted to have you here, Tim. But before we, we go into the, um, the whole kind of area of uh, investing and, and what's be, uh, even been going on with value and so on, I just want to get your take on the, the last 18 months of what I'm calling the, the kind of banana syndrome, because we've often talked about financial repression, but what we've seen in the last 18 months has been a lot more than that, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it, every morning I now find I have to sort of pinch myself to, to check that I'm still I'm actually still awake. It's, it's an extraordinary environment. No, nothing that I've ever experienced in my life compares to this, and I hope that it will soon be over. But I mean, uh, the, the, uh, I, if you told me 18 months ago that I, I lived in a country where I could be kind of effectively placed under house arrest for weeks on end and then have all kinds of restrictions on the freedom of what I could do, where I could go, where I could travel to without giving all sorts of details of my movements, uh, you know, I'd have thought you were, you were living in some dystopian future. And yet it became reality in 2020, uh, don't you? I mean, it's just I find it bizarre. Yeah, as I was saying just before we came on, on air, um, I think we owe the people of Germany from the 1930s a huge apology because they've always been treated as outliers culturally in the world for what happened uh, in the, after the Weimar experience. And um, I, I think we, we owe them a debt of uh, apology now. Yeah, and, and it seems that uh, you know fiscal discipline generally was thrown out of the window during banana syndrome. And, and you know, I, I find it quite amusing in a way that you know, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak spending uh, amounts of money that would probably make Jeremy Corbyn blush, uh, and yet as a so-called Tory government. Yeah, we've 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 gone through the, the we certainly gone down the rabbit hole and, and through the looking glass here to the extent that the the Conservative government is spending money like like a bunch of drunken sailors, and as you say, it's it's it's, it's fiscal uh, incontinence is something that that makes a, the prospect of a Corbyn government now look quite attractive, bizarrely. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought I'd hear myself say that. Um, but also, I suppose, you know, uh, what I found particularly depressing, really, was the the willing compliance with such massive restrictions on our freedom um, and people clearly putting, uh, uh, you know, their, their health above their liberty um, mm -hmm. uh, with relatively flimsy evidence about, you know, how, how serious the, the issue was for the vast majority of people. It's as if there's a mass psychosis uh, abroad. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, 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 and, it, and that what's, what's most disconcerting about it is that it's global. It's not limited to any one country. It seems to be the entire, not just the Anglosphere, it's the entire West. Yeah, there was almost like competition as to who could be the most... Uh, it's like a, like a Monty Python sketch as to who can, who can inflict as much damage upon themselves as possible. Exactly, exactly. So, so, of course, 
back to our context here, uh, as if investing wasn't tough enough before all this, um, this obviously makes setting out to both create and preserve wealth in the 2020s a, a bigger challenge than ever. I mean, at a sort of 10,000 foot level, what's your take on how what has been happening is going to impact investors? It's a very good question. And no one has a crystal ball entirely. So our, our crystal ball's no, no shinier than anybody else's. In some respects, life is actually quite easy now to the extent in, in, in investment terms, because if you accept that interest rates are at basically the lowest level they've ever been in history, 5,000 year lows, then the one thing you can say with absolute certainty is you shouldn't touch bonds with a barge pole. So if you eliminate the debt market from your investable universe, then things become a lot easier because by a process of elimination, stocks then become effectively as a, as a major tradable asset class, the only real game in town. And then within that, I mean, I've, I've been a value manager, I guess, all my career. Um, whether one is, a, one is born or made a value manager, I'll leave to others to debate. But the, the, the fact is that if you're concerned about valuations in, in certain areas of the stock market, notably the US, notably the tech sector, then by a process again of elimination, you end up looking at basic value. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the way we would define value globally, so we, we're happy to invest in stocks globally, where, where we think we can add value for, for our clients, that is, then firstly, whatever the company is, we're not really, we're agnostic as to sector. But whatever a company is doing, it needs to be generating scads of, of cash. So the first metric we look at is free cash flow. We want lots of cash generation. We focus on cash because you can't fake cash. You can fake revenues through, you know, jiggery pokery on the accounting process, but you can't fake cash. And the second thing that is absolutely paramount for us is it needs to have, these companies need to have little or no debt on their balance sheet. So the companies that are going to be most heavily challenge in this environment going forward are going to be the ones that have the most leverage. And that basically means small and mid-cap America. Compare and contrast that to a market like, say, Japan, which has been a long-standing favorite of ours, where because they've been through a 25-year grinding deflationary depression already, Japanese companies now have the healthiest balance sheets in the world. And I think now Japan actually yields, amazingly yields more than the US market. Quite astonishing, really. So that in some respects, there are quite easy decisions that we can make, which is avoid X market, buy Y market instead, because it's much cheaper, it's better value, and it has better growth prospects. And also, the, the, I, I think one of the trends or themes that might sit behind this is a lot of people in the, in the 2010s went down a kind of a, a passive uh, uh, index following route with ETFs and so on, very low charges. Mm -hmm. And as the S&P 500 rose, or at least certain components of it rose yeah. massively, they did very well. Um, do you think that strategy will work in the 2020s or do you think we're going to have to be more selective? I'd be surprised if it can entirely hold. So my thesis would go as follows. At some point, the bond market is going to crack. Couldn't tell you when, it's already been a 40 year bull run, but at some point it has to, it has to go, it has to break apart and yields have to rise. But the authority is going to attempt to mitigate that by yield curve uh, suppression. If they attempt to do that, and I'm sure they will, then the, 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 the only remaining escape valve is basically the currency market. So um, with the, the seminal experience of my start of my career was Sterling's ethnic cleansing from the ERM in 1992. And what that showed you is that governments can try and suppress or control stock markets and bond markets. But the one market that's too big even for governments to control is the currency market, is the, the foreign exchange market. It's too big for everybody. So that's the one that everyone should be afraid of. If, if the governments or the central banks attempt to suppress long-term interest rates, whether that's in the US or the UK or anywhere else, it'll be the currency that is the escape valve. So I suspect what will happen is we'll see as part of this whole inflationary process anyway, which is clearly being baked into the financial asset prices as we speak by fiscal uh, imprudence, then it'll be, it'll be the currencies that start to, start to get whacked. And it'll probably be from the emerging markets all the way through to the ultimately the core. So in that environment, all roads in our mind lead to the likes of gold and silver, the monetary metals, because they can't be printed. Okay, so, so what you're saying is, uh, 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 if let's say you know, the central banks keep on buying government treasuries, which effectively keeps the, the, the uh, coupons on them quite low and the price yeah. is high, um, uh, then what will happen is ultimately the dollar will weaken. Um, right. well, the, the currency of any, of any government practicing this, this policy. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and so, I mean, clearly, as, as we know, uh, these currencies have already lost most of their value uh, since 1971 and good old uh, Tricky Dicky taking the, sure. the dollar off the gold standard. So they're, they're not exactly a store of value. Sure. Um, but the, the so, so if you, OK, we take bonds out of the equation. Uh, so we then, have to... then basically leaves you with stocks and then within the stock market for us, I mean, as value managers, as, as a value management company with the word value in our title, clearly. That's where we're going to go fishing, um, but it makes more sense now than ever if you also if you also think as we do that if the bond market does at some point crack, that'll likely take some of the momentum off the growth stock um, strategy as well. So all this money that's in passive vehicles, blithely chasing growth, you know, we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars now on that bandwagon. Um, I, I just say look out below. Aren't there also some fundamental imbalances building? Because you, almost, as as those funds get bigger and bigger, they have actually more control over the market, sure. and, and you kind of wonder, well, who this, who they're going to sell to? Well, exactly. This is so. This is the pertinent question: Who is going to be the buyer of last resort if the market's basically already saturated? And that's yeah. answer answers on a postcard. <laughs> so, so do you? Okay, could a a bond? I mean, a bond market crash, yeah, okay, technically you imagine it should happen at some point, um, presumably only if the, if the central banks stop buying, because uh, who, who knows how long they can keep this. Yeah, so the around. last time the Fed attempted to sort of taper, we had the taper tra- tantrum of whatever it was 18 months ago, and the market had a bit of a wobble. So basically the, the Fed and the other major central banks have boxed themselves into a complete corner now. They can't realistically lower interest rates because they're only at zero, or in some cases negative anyway. But by the same token, although inflation is now building like a like a like the lava under an active volcano, they can't raise rates either because they'll crash the markets. So what do they do? The answer is they well they're, they're completely stuffed, which is why again in our world all, all roads lead to basically defensive strategies, including owning the likes of the monetary metals and related mining interests, because this has to lead in our world. We may we may yet see a deflationary correction, but it's going to end in the mother of all inflations. Well, that, that, this seems to be the big debate that, that everyone's, you know, some, some are saying this inflation's transitory, others are saying, no, it's not, it's here for the long term, others are saying, no, we're actually heading to deflation with technology and various other drivers. So uh, wh- where do you sit on this kind of inflation deflation uh, paradigm and what, where do you see it flipping over perhaps from one to the other? Well, my, my, my sort of economics is naturally lie with the classical econo- economists and the Austrian, so-called Austrian school. According to those guys, the inflation is already here because inflation is the increase in the money supply. What we mean by inflation, which is the, the higher prices of goods, is the second order effect of the, of the increase in, in, in base money, which has already arrived. So it's, it's already here. We're just waiting for it to feed through into the real economy. Yeah, and I mean, I hear some people refer to that as currency debasement. I guess that has the same net effect that you you have lower spending power with a given amount of pounds or dollars. Yeah, it's, it's all about purchasing power. And the the, 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 the tragedy is that you know, people who, who, who work hard have been through the misery of the last two years, uh, and they're seeing now the, the purchasing power of their money debauched on a daily basis. It's, it's a tragedy. So, so when you start looking for you know value stocks, because you know some people talk about the everything bubble and that you know, all this money has actually inflated all kinds of asset prices, uh, do you still find that there are companies out there in the stock markets of the world which are plainly undervalued even after all of this uh, uh, this, this this money printing? Absolutely. I mean, we're we're very picky, so I wouldn't say there's a, a huge universe of value opportunities for us, but there's definitely a universe, and we're we're a boutique firm, so we're we're not managing. Nine trillion dollars. We're managing two hundred and fifty million pounds of other people's money, including our own. And uh, so it's quite easy for us to find value opportunities, particularly in small and mid cap stocks, because they're not widely owned by the the big funds. So whatever whatever the likes of BlackRock are doing is an opportunity for us, because we're not we're not playing in the same we're not playing the same game. Okay, and and, and so what do you see as the trigger for these value stocks getting from where they are today to to what you'd regard as a fair value? Okay, do you have the chart for Seaboard available? Because this is quite yep. pertinent to this question. Hold on, let me uh, bring that up for you. There we go. Okay, so this is um, a share price chart of a company called Seaboard Corporation in North America. Seaboard's a diversified agribusiness. It started out in um, grains. It's now a sort of vertically integrated supplier of a variety of agricultural products and infrastructure um, supply routes uh, and they're 
the largest turkey farmer in North America, for example, they have an only fifty percent ownership of a company called Butterball Turkey. So the, what you see on the chart, you see three lines on this chart. Three lines on this chart. It feels like a song, isn't it? Um, I'm not. Don't worry. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to force that on you. No, we'd we'd, we'd have to edit that out. Tim. <laughs> so um, we've got three lines. We've got um, we've got a white line, which is the share price of Seaboard, and this is going back to 1989. And you can see the white line is quite volatile. That's the nature of the stock market for you. Um, there's a green line and there's a purple line. The purple line is the S and P 500 index. So to get to the point, what you can see with the benefit of hindsight is that Seaboard has done amazingly well. In other words, it is possible to beat the market. The S and P 500 over this period generates a return of 1,532 percent, and Seaboard generated a return of 3,500 percent. So it's it's double, more than double what the stock market did. So that's the first point. It is possible to beat the market. The second point is that clearly the shares are volatile because you can see from the chart they're all over the place. The, 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 the secret source here, and this is germane to our entire process, is the green line. The green line is book value per share of Seaboard. It's almost a straight line. It's not that volatile. And that's basically just the inherent value of the company. So what we're saying here is mm. as, as follows. Try, firstly, try and identify good companies. Good companies will often be owner managed, i.e. The, the management has a meaningful slug of ownership in the business, so they've got skin in the game. And then secondly, um, when you've identified these companies and you can buy them cheaply, wait effectively for the white line, the share price to approach or ideally trade below book. Because you can see that there is a relationship between those two upper lines. The white line is shares, the green line is, is book value, inherent value. The book value per share does tend to track the share price over time. The share price overshoots from time to time, gets irrationally optimistic, and then sometimes more rarely, in the case of Seaboard, irrationally pessimistic. But over time, they basically trade in line with each other. So the market does identify over the medium term good companies, and it just tracks their value. The shares overshoot, so then this is when you need to be selective about your timing when you get in them. But this, this to me, I wish someone had shown me a chart like this 30 years ago at the start of my career, because it would have made stock picking and investing a whole lot easier. It's, it's this simple, it's this straightforward. All you need to do, identify quality companies and then wait until they trade cheaply in the market. Lather, rinse, repeat. Okay. Uh, to, be, to be fair, I mean, apart from obviously there's a sustained period in the early part of the century there where you could have got in, uh, you know, with the the, um, the white line below the green line. But the, sure. the other times, obviously, it looks like the financial crisis was another time and the start of banana syndrome was another time yeah. to get in. Again. So, the, so timing does the, matter, I guess. <laughs> for sure. But, but taking the medium term view, if you're, taking, if you're a, a typical investor, you're going to be buying over time anyway. So you won't be buying in a one, one clip necessarily. You'll be phasing in your investments over your investing lifetime. So that, that's, that works well. Dollar cost averaging always works. I was going to say, if, if that was your, your preferred approach, even when you've identified something like this, you'd still dollar cost average in, would you? Yeah, yeah because you just have a particularly when the market feels very frothy, which it does today. Yeah. Or the, okay, the other side of the coin, of course, is, is you know, having the, the chutzpah or the cojones to do it when the market's been crashing and burning, like last March or, or well, this 2008. Is, this, this, is, this is exactly right. This is the other thing. So, so much of the investment business is about psychology. So the, the mass and the analysis gets you so far, but so, so much is about psychology. So one reason, one thing that we, we do with our portfolios is we don't just invest in value stocks. We invest in trend-following funds, which are a type of... Uh, price related, price sensitive strategy, so momentum based strategy essentially. And then the third component part, because we don't buy bonds anymore, we probably won't for the foreseeable future until it gets a whole lot cheaper. Um, the third component part is what we call real assets. And by way of real assets, I mean tangible, non financial things, things that if you drop them on your foot, it hurts. So that clearly includes things like the monetary metals, gold and silver, and related mining interests. So the beauty of this approach, this sort of three uh, pillar approach, if you like, is that we're always invested. We're not always invested in the stock market, but we're always invested in something. The problem by taking a, a, a timing decision on the market and saying, things seem a bit freaky, I want out, is that may well be justified, but when on earth do you get back in? Because the recent time to get back in was in March 09, but in March 09, it felt like the world was about to end. So it's not easy getting back in. So we prefer to be in throughout. 
And, and do you find, uh, because of the value basis of what you're doing, and because almost by definition it's somewhat contrarian to certainly where the markets have been, do, do you find that you're um, you're underperforming at times when, say, the you know the tech stocks and the S and P five hundred is is shooting for the stars? Or, definitely, uh, definitely. So I mean, this is this has been well identified by a lot of commentators, and the, the, the sad reality, the inevitable reality, is that you know, as, <coughs> excuse me, as, as one journalist has said short-term periods of excruciating underperformance come with the territory of value investing. It's part and parcel of it. So in other words, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. But uh, over a longer time the, long, the long-term returns are impressive. So most most of the, the data that we, we are familiar with is over the long run. When I say long run, I mean like 100, 200 year period type long runs. Over the long run, value traps is growth by some meaningful margin. Growth has clearly wiped the floor with value over the last 10 years, but that doesn't mean that value has lost money. It just means it hasn't made as much as growth has. So it really depends on what your objective is. If your objective is no slow and steady wins the race, then that's value for you. If your objective is sex and drugs and rock and roll, then go with growth. But also, I mean, often I find increasingly, especially as I will come on to talk about things like the cryptocurrency world, but people tend to take very entrenched positions that, you know, they, their thing is right. Now, what, yeah. What's wrong with a strategy that says I'm going to put this amount of asset allocation into growth strategy and this amount into a value strategy? Nothing, nothing inherently wrong with that. It depends on what your objective is. So our objective is quite clear. We're dealing with people's life savings. So our primary objective is not to lose the money. So if your capital, if capital preservation in absolute terms is your objective, then a growth policy is, is not compatible with that because there are going to be times during a correction when you may lose half or more of your money. We never expect to incur those kind of drawdowns. Okay. So our, okay. our argument would be that if we can compound relatively modestly but positively over year on year on year, that will over time outperform a strategy of just owning the whole market. Because we don't, we don't, the drawdowns are never as great, well, ideally never as great as those of the broader market. Okay, but I, I guess one of the kind of flies in the ointment here is, you know, inflation. You talked about potential hyperinflation, which can yeah. have a really uh, massive impact on, you know, wealth and wealth preservation. So, so um, I guess that leads us into one of your, what I know has been a core strategy of yours for many years, and that's the, the monetary metals, gold and silver. Yeah, I mean, it seems to us that if you want to hedge against the risk of uncomfortably high inflation, where better to start than basically those forms of money that have always held their value? So if you want a definition of long term value holding, I, I submit, I humbly submit gold. So that the sort of the cliche argument is that, you know, in the days of ancient Rome, a gentleman of the period could clothe himself perfectly adequately using an ounce of gold. And the same argument holds true today, that gold at $1,800 an ounce. That's long-term purchasing power. Indeed. But what, what I think has really surprised me, and in, in, in certainly in 2021, is we seem to have a perfect setup for gold to do really well, and yet it seems to have been quite uh, anemic in its performance. Have you any so well, ha hasn't, hasn't is not the same as won't. So I agree that it's been strange, bizarrely underperforming at just a time when you expect it to be shooting the lights out. But I just say... Keep the faith. Just, just hang on, because this is. Uh, it feels, feels to me like this. This this volcano is going to blow to the upside, and the potential returns to be made could be quite astonishing. So, if if, if my life savings are a hundred, um, you know, what proportion of that should I be putting into gold and silver? Do you think? So, in terms of our breakdown for clients, if you were coming to us as a potential client, we'd have roughly four forty percent of that portfolio would be invested in value stocks, generic you know, generic value stocks. Mm -hmm. Roughly 20% would be in trend following funds and roughly 40% would be in real assets, including gold and silver. So it could be as much as, say, 20% for bullion. Okay. And yeah, it's probably quite a punchy allocation relative to most wealth managers. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you talk about real assets, is there anything other than gold and silver you'd put in that category? I mean, other commodities. So other, other parts of the commodity sector, we don't really invest in property at the moment. It's partly because it isn't really a fungible asset class. So you, you, property is not as liquid as say gold is because gold is, you know, available in space and time and all these kind of arguments. Whereas property is, well, it depends where you are. It depends where the thing is physically located and what the valuation is. So it's a much more nuanced argument, but um, certainly we're, we're raising our allocation to the broader commodities complex as we speak.
Okay, and do, do you do you believe that? I mean, some are saying we're heading for another commodity super cycle. Is that is that your view? That seems plausible to me. So I mean, I think we're going to be in for some short term economic pain in the light of you know, dealing with all the, the sort of nonsense of the last two years and the banana crisis. But um, in the bigger picture, I think we're setting up ourselves for a huge bull run in commodities. So I think that now is as good a time as any to be looking selectively at what's available in the market. And, and I think that the other thing that seems to me to be becoming a core part of the agenda, if you like, is, is, is what you often refer to as geopolitical risk. We've got you know, yeah. China up to all sorts of bellicose things. We've got yeah. you know, America sort of supposedly you know, trying to counter that. I mean, where, where, where do you see um, geopolitical risk impacting investors over the coming decade? Everywhere. I mean, it's difficult to find a market that looks safe and stable right now. The one thing I'd add on the, on the topic just of China is that we don't invest in China. We don't invest in China primarily, firstly, as, as investment managers, because the valuation argument doesn't meet our requirements. Secondly, because on moral grounds, we, we can't invest in China as, as it stands at the moment with its political regime. And, and also the clear and evident danger to investors of doing so when government sure. edicts can wipe out a whole industry. But that's, that's the weird thing, though, that sort of, you know, we, we know the experience of the 20th century in political terms and the rise of you know, communism and fascism. It's like everyone's now going down that same path. We, we, you know, the, the, the problem with the, the whole uh, banana crisis is that uh, the big state is back with a vengeance. That has clear implications for what investors should do with their money. For us, that means you should not have your money in fear investments. Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's true. Now, w w I know you say you don't invest in property, but it's it's a major asset class, and certainly I'm just saying popular. we. I'm just saying we don't currently. Yeah, but what what's your view on where property lies in this decade, given all of the above? I, well, I was doing a podcast with um, a gentleman called Akil Patel recently, and he's a long term chartist, and he's very positive on property as an asset class. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not so positive myself, only because I view property as being a bit like a bond like asset. So since I view the out, out, uh, outlook for fixed income investments as being fraud, that by definition or by extension, I have to view the prospects of property as an asset class is somewhat fraud as well. But that said, that doesn't mean that there won't be cheap properties available, but it's, it'll be on a case by case basis. OK, um, so so uh, I suppose in terms of wealth preservation, uh, property has done a pretty good job if you take a view over the sure. last hundred years. Um, but also, you, you, obviously, we talk about the precious metals, but one way of certainly historically, one way of leveraging your belief and faith in the precious metals has been to invest in the people who mine for them. Um, do, do you see value in, in, in gold and silver miners at the moment? Absolutely. I mean, if anything, more, more so now. So you've got this really weird situation where the gold price is where it is. I think it, it, it is going higher, but time will tell. But the 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 the, the listed share the listed share prices of, of both junior and senior gold and silver miners it's like it's like it's like there is nothing going on at all. So these companies are being given away in the stock market by and large now. Very highly profitable, generating huge amounts of cash, very low multiples. It, interestingly, very little leverage relative to their historic um, debt ratios. So everything is screaming buy except the share price. And that's, well, actually the, the, share, the share price kind of is by being as cheap as it is. So with this is, I, mean, I don't want to over egg this pudding, but this is probably the most compelling investment opportunity I've seen in my lifetime. Interesting, yeah. I, I know you did a recent report on the uh, on the uh, Price Value Partners website about that, and you actually identified some of the companies you think are in the strongest position to, to see that uh, share yeah, price grow. We lifted the kimono. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. OK. Now, obviously, all this talk about gold, uh, I have to come on to the, 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 the topic of the moment, which is digital gold and Bitcoin. Um, uh, you know, where, where, where do you stand on that whole kind of cryptocurrency sector, Tim? So personally, as a libertarian, I have to endorse the concept of cryptocurrencies because I don't think the state should have a monopoly on money issuance. Uh, that said, as investors, uh, we've yet to take the plunge. We may never take the plunge in crypto simply because we just don't know how to value these things. The, 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 the usefulness of, say, the listed stock market opportunity is that you know how to value these things, or hopefully you know, have some idea how you value them. You can value them against interest rates and against you know, earnings and all these kind of things. How do you value Bitcoin? How do you value um, Ethereum or Ripple or XRP or any of these, you know, Dogecoin or a thousand other cryptos? The answer is we don't know. I, I certainly don't know. That said, 
there may well be merit for the private investors this year to take the plunge and having, let's say, 1%, 2% of their portfolio, of their overall aggregate net worth in cryptocurrencies. Because if it goes to zero, it's not the end of the world, but you've st- you'll still have the opportunity to make two, three, whatever X times your money. So that's probably the way to, to trade it, to play it at the moment. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of misunderstandings around the sector, to be honest. I, I've been going down that rabbit hole for over a year now. And a lot of these companies, they're, they're nothing to do with alternative currencies. They're actually doing things like you know decentralized finance, which is yeah. really quite radical. And if you look at things like smart contracts, you know, we could do away with lawyers, which surely must be a, a worthwhile cause in, in and of itself. Well, well, not only that, but I think in the fullness of time, we're going to be doing away with the banks. So, so hallelujah for that. Um, it's interesting. I think this, this quote is credited to Bill Gates back in the 90s, but I don't know who said it. I can't confirm who said it, but whoever it was said, banking is necessary, but banks aren't. And if anybody has had any dealings with any bank lately, you realise you're getting an appalling service, not even getting any compensation by way of interest. So this, this is a game for the banks to lose. And I think the cryptocurrencies over time will just eat away their, their whole market. And I'm delighted at that prospect. Well, Me yeah. Say, we don't own banks. Yeah, that's right. And I, I uh, you know, every time that I want to make an investment, I, I try to send money from my Barclays bank account to Coinbase, you know, a publicly listed company, one of the biggest exchanges in the world. It gets stopped by their security uh, and fraud mm-hmm. team. And I end up having to have a half hour phone call pleading with them to allow me to send my funds to the place where I want to make an investment. You know, this is banking in the 21st century. And yet, and yet the, the, the major banks, including well, no names, HSBC, are some of the biggest money launderers in the world it's quite <laughs> exactly. extraordinary I know, but I, I don't know whether this shows a genuine concern for their customers or whether they are absolutely bricking it in terms of realizing that they, they could, as you say, be out of business perhaps by the end of this decade. Well, what you see is the world's smallest violin playing just for the High Street Bank. <laughs> yes, I thought I could hear something. Yeah. OK, so so um, you're, you're um, not personally going for the crypto sector at all. You've got no involvement in that? Uh, someone, someone, Dan Tubb gave me, I think, 20,000 Satoshis a couple of weeks ago, which is worth apparently about 12 quid. So I've got a, I've got a tiny stake in the game, but not, not anything meaningful. Excellent. OK, so um, as we as we look ahead, then, you know, what, what would be your kind of uh, advice to people watching us that perhaps have taken a somewhat passive view? A lot of people don't really know what their pensions are invested in or, you know, what their ISAs are invested in. Mm. Do you think this is a time to become more active in the management of your investment definitely. portfolio? I think definitely you need, you need to be much more up to speed with what your pension fund, ISA, SIP, whatever, holds. And if it's in the form of debt instruments, look very carefully at the composition and if, and if necessary, replace with something that's going to have more lasting value. I cannot stress uh, highly enough, at some point the bond market is going to explode. It may not be this year, it may not be next year, but at some point it will. It'll be like the old line from Hemingway, how do you go bankrupt well, slowly and then all at once? These things don't happen in linear fashion. They happen just like that. So um, be, very, <coughs> excuse me, be very careful about bond exposure. We, we have basically nil exposure with our clients. Um, if your manager, if your stockbroker or portfolio manager has meaningful bond allocation on your behalf, ask him why, because there is no value in that market whatsoever. And then beyond that, my advice would simply be uh, diversify. We live, we, 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 we're currently going through very, very tricky waters. Uh, it feels like there's a storm brewing. So I think diversification by asset class and asset type and, and underlying holding Diversification is the last remaining free lunch in finance. Diversify like crazy because you can't be too careful these days. And also, I, I think I would add to that, perhaps be wary of of, of uh, concentration in a small number of mega funds, because, yes. you know, as Warren Buffett's finding, once you get into the hundreds of billions, it's very hard to move the dial with individual investment decisions, whereas a, a boutique like yourself, you know, you can you can actually really seek out things that are going to give a genuine uh, a measurable return to a client portfolio. Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the, the, the Leviathan firms fare during the next downturn. So I, I fear it may be a religious experience for their clients. <laughs> yes, and, and not in a, a good way. Yeah, well, I mean, the trouble is, I mean, obviously, you know, 
some of us have been around the block a few times and what I'm hearing from a lot of people that are talking now, uh, particularly in the technology sector, is those famous words that I remember hearing in the early 2000s, just before I lost a shed loan in the NASDAQ, this mm -hmm. time it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, are you hearing well, it's those? Never different. It's never different and human nature doesn't change. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, do you think, I mean, I, I know timing of these things is impossible, but uh, do you think we're quite close to a significant correction in, in the market? It, it feels like it. So my advice there would be enjoy the party, but dance near the door. Yeah. And, and would you be moving more into cash at the moment to be ready? To no, move? because ca not really, unless, unless you have specific liabilities that you need to make, to make advanced preparation for. So we're, we're pretty much fully invested for both in our own capacity and, and for our clients across that range of value stocks, trend followers and, and, and real assets and precious metals. We, we want to be in, invested, but we don't want to be all in the stock market. So I accept the stock market seems to be acutely high risk at, at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. It wouldn't surprise me if we do get a major correction within the next 12 months, triggered by what we can't say, uh, but it could be the bond market crashing. Um, but the, the point again is, if you, if you take the example of the, say, the early 70s oil shock, if you were in the FT30, which was the equivalent of the FTSE 100 at the time, if you sold ahead of the crash, you didn't have time to get back in because the market did such a pronounced V-shaped recovery, there was no time to get back in. And because we hate to market time, we will always be invested. Uh, we won't be invested in the whole market, so we're very selective, but we think that with our, our answer to the whole market timing issue is just always, always be invested in something in the best thing available at that given time, because then you don't have to worry about when do we get back in? Because the time to get back in is when it feels like it's the end of the world. Exactly, that's right. And, and very few people have the cojones to do that. So they miss it out. And then the, you, you, often a few weeks can make a massive difference to it. Again, exactly right. So a lot of the returns of the market could come from very short, amazingly concentrated bursts. So you want to be in the market all the whole time, basically avoiding. And then you just take the Ben Graham route. So we're Ben Graham Value Investors. And he said, and he boiled it down to two things, which is basically avoid the bad stuff and don't overpay for the good stuff. Mm. It's not rocket science. OK. And interestingly, obviously, you know, many people know you from your, your Money Week uh, contributions. Money Week seems to have a view that the British stock market at the moment is definitely in the value territory. What's your take on the other FTSE at the moment? I agree. I mean, we, we don't have a huge amount of um, UK holders. We have a few. So there is definitely value, some value in the UK market. I think I saw on Bloomberg the other day that um, the FTSE's had a nine-year period now of basically exporting capital, i.e. people have been migrating out of the UK into other markets, probably the, notably the US. So the UK is definitely a value territory, but then it comes down to individual opportunities. We're not finding that many. We're finding them globally, but not, not, not excessively in the UK yet. And do you see what, what do you see as the 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 kind of outlook for you know post Brexit Britain? They're trying to create this high wage, high tech economy. Uh, do, do you see Britain having a, a a growing role in the world? Given that, for example, Europe itself seems to be <laughs> almost imploding. Before the banana crisis, I would have said yes. Now I think we have to wait until we get a new government, and I I, I don't dare think what that government would be. But it has to be not the current lot because they're awful. <laughs> would you like to expand on that a bit? Well, they seem to have lost, the Tory party seems to have completely lost touch with its source code. So it is impossible to record. We just had the budget, which is the biggest tax and spend budget probably in my lifetime. Um, it's certainly up there. It, it is impossible to reconcile the budget of this week with, let's say, Thatcherism or Thatcherite policy. Um, the big state is back. The big state is awful at allocating capital. The big state is awful at investing. Everything it touches turns to ash. So the state should be shrinking, not growing, is all I can say. And I hope that whatever the future government we may get is, whatever its composition, I hope it's a composition, basically a government of national unity comprising a lot of localised grassroots activist parties. But I think any party that advocates for lockdown does not deserve to be in existence. And that's basically the Tories and Labour out. Yeah, but I think that one of the troubles I've sensed for some time is that, um, uh, you know, if I, if I can use, a, I suppose, a Thatcher expression, people like us just just don't seem to have a, a, a political franchise. I just, I just have yeah, no we're idea. Completely, we're completely homeless, I agree. I've seen the phrase politically homeless so many times over the last two years. Yeah, yeah, and I don't see and anything I say, I, say, I say, come with the hour, come with the man. So whether it's Lawrence Fox or somebody else, they're, they're out there somewhere. Right. OK. I'm, I'm, I'm a great I'm believer thinking... in, I'm a great believer. I mean, it's like Churchill said about optimism. Someone said, you're optimistic, aren't you? He says, well, I don't see much point in, in anything else. 
That's <laughs> true enough, true enough. Well, we will see what happens. But for now, I think some, some great information, some great advice there, Tim. Thanks so much for joining us and look forward to chatting and catching up with you again soon. Good a pleasure. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Bye now.